infodemic management is basically at the frontier of the public health practice. And this is what uh, Liz and I uh, would like to guide you through. What does the intervening actually look like? So this is the uh, infodemic manager's intervention toolbox <clears throat> that we've prepared. Um, and we'd like to spend about half an hour uh, talking about this uh, until we get to listen to a couple, uh, several examples and then do a, a group exercise. Liz, are you ready? Let's do it. Great. <laughs> so um, you've heard um, over uh, several sessions now, uh, as we've been uh, as we've been uh, discussing together, that really what we as infodemic management are, we are the glue. We actually dot connect between different parts of the public health system, between our health system that don't necessarily always talk to each other, but actually are addressing different parts of the infodemic elephant. So we don't connect between the health programs, the emergency response structures, risk communication, community engagement functions. And we really try to ensure that they have the insights they need and also that we complement that and that we create an enabling environment uh, through the public health system so that their interventions, their actions, their objectives are more easily met. And uh, so the way that we're, we need to be always thinking about infodemic management is that actually the bulk of our work happens in the preparedness part, outside of the emergency. Systems that we strengthen, connections that we make, the types of uh, things that we can do in routine time, so that then through this uh, system strengthening and the, the, health, uh, the enablement of healthy behaviors, when emergency hits, we can then we have the capital, we have the, uh, the practices, we have the connections already set up so that we can more effectively respond uh, in an emergency. And this is why um, uh, this step number three uh, of the process that we are going through uh, in the training is, is really important. And uh, as you heard Howard speak about human-centered design, the takeaway message also from his talk for me is that human centeredness is not only about looking the client, who are you serving, who are you trying to uh, reach or adapt uh, or, or influence behaviors from. It's actually a practice of yourself. You actually, as a practitioner with the team, uh, implement and practice human centeredness on yourself, on your team. And this actually permeates also in how you end up uh, also uh, uh, changing yourself, your own practices, and the practices of people in the community of individuals uh, as well. That's a very profound way of looking at public health practice and public health systems. So Liz and I prepared uh, this overview uh, of, of the interdependencies or components of, of, um, of the levels uh, of the infodemic, the perspectives of how one needs to look at the infodemic. Um, this is actually a simplified version of uh, what was discussed um, a couple of weeks ago at the WHO Infodemic Management Conference when we met with health authorities and academia specifically to look at, well, how do we improve metrics? Uh, how do we create uh, measurements and monitoring systems so that we could have a better sense of what the burden of the infodemic is? And what you see here is uh, at least four levels of complexity when we think about what influences what influences the infodemic elephant. One is the information ecosystem. We in a digitized society are affected by uh, the information ecosystem online and offline that, uh, that, that provides us not only with information but allows us to have um, interactions with people and we uh, and also creates uh, different um, identities. The way that we have uh, different identities, different roles in our lives, uh, professionally, um, as a mother, as a uh, as a member of a community, um, a member of a church uh, congregation, etc. So so do we actually build identities and also online, and we project them in different co uh, communities that we uh, build. So. The information ecosystem is a big part of how we need to think about the infodemic and how the infodemic influences people's behavior. <clears throat> then there's a variety of factors that are marked in blue. 
um, that relates to uh, what drives uh, uh, the effects of the infodemic on, on people's individual behavior. So, um, and this has to do with how people search for information, how they feel about information, how they process it, and how, they, uh, how that information then manifests in direct health behaviors, but also uh, in, in other kinds of direct or indi indirect psychological effects, for example, anxiety uh, or, um, or, or stress related to, um, uh, for example, power dynamics in the family, et cetera. And then the third level of thinking about the infodemic and the effects has to do actually with the health system effects. So we observe um, a variety of um, uh, disease states or even deaths related to um, the infodemic, <coughs> um, uh, uh, not just lack of information or misinformation, but people's, uh, people, the way, uh, uh, as a consequence of how people uh, interact with information, make decisions and enact health behaviors. Uh, health system also spends a lot of effort in the public health prevention activities, trying to influence individual behaviors, right? And those are also uh, uh, activities associated with cost, but also can be levers uh, that we can use in order to promote health behaviors. Um, and then uh, there's uh, another big chunk, even bigger chunk of the aspect of the infodemic that interplays uh, with, um, uh, with the health system uh, in a feedback loop. And this is also the wider economic effects of the infodemic and this is wider societal impact, impacts of the infodemic. Um, um, and this has to do, uh, and this is getting more and more complex. I think we've seen it also throughout the evolution of the COVID-19 pandemic because um, uh, uh, what people experience in their livelihood uh, or uh, through their ability to uh, uh, provide for themselves, their families, uh, the stressors they have in their own environment related to the economic, uh, their economic and social social status, um, those stressors are part of the people's decision making process and uh, uh, that leads also to uh, an enabling environment that leads people to enacting health behaviors or not. So these are four big air chunks of perspectives that you as an infodemic manager need to think about. Uh, uh, also when trying to solve uh, uh, the issues that you diagnose. And this, would you perhaps um, discuss the questions to consider? Sure. Um, so often when we're thinking about designing around humans and we want the, we want to encourage a specific behavior, we need to understand, uh, walk a mile or walk several kilometers in the shoes of your target audience, understand what about their experience is part, uh, particularly difficult or hard or painful and working backwards from there. What are the barriers that people face uh, uh, between uh, what they're doing now versus what you want them to do? Um, and then what can you do to uh, lower those barriers? Um, and so just to recognize there's not going to be a single intervention that Tina and I will talk to you about, spoiler alert, that will answer all aspects of this concept map. There's not one infodemic in, uh, management intervention that will cover the entire field. Um, so you really have to be specific as to what part um, of this concept map will you try to influence? Um, and also, what area does the health authority have the most influence over? So, you know, I would argue that generally speaking, health authorities have way more influence over the red part of the diagram as it relates to the health system versus maybe the green where we're talking about the wider information ecosystem. So just recognizing that there might be a lot of different uh, aspects to uh, the infodemic on this concept map, but you might not have a, a reasonable degree of control over many of them. So you are not able to actually address a lot of the contributors to stress, to pain points, to uh, to, to, to risks or concerns uh, that might be contributing to the wider infodemic and to people's uh, behaviors. So you really need to focus. Where can you do the most good? Um, and then also think about what are some of the, your, your menu of interventions that are available to try? 
why. And we'll talk about what that list of interventions uh, types looks like. Um, and then ultimately, what is it that you want to measure? And then when you figure it out, how do you measure if it works or if it doesn't work? Um, this is really critical because we're very much in the, the, the form of um, throwing spaghetti against a wall and seeing what sticks. There's a lot of different innovation happening in the pandemic management space, and people are just trying stuff out because we're in a pandemic. Um, and so, you know, we need to do a better job of measuring what we're doing, evaluating what we're doing, and sharing that out with others so we don't have others trying to do the exact same thing with similar results and wasting their time. So what can we do to get all of us past this emergency faster? And we can do that by measuring what we're doing, evaluating what we're doing, and sharing out those experiences. <laughs> Great, uh, Liz. Thank you. I actually want to also um, make an interlude here before we go into discussion about the interventions. Um, just to underscore what Liz said, what Howard said in the previous lecture, um, why here's another aspect of why it's really important for us to really think about iteration, uh, working through, um, uh, working early through iteration, working early uh, and, and implementing the human-centered design principles that Howard was talking about. Actually, because I noticed uh, in many of the conversations that I've had, a lot of times we really, really, really underestimate how fast the information ecosystem is actually changing our society. And, and, um, and I would say, especially the last 10 years, for example, uh, since the internet platforms decided to, for example, move to ad-driven news feeds and start developing extremely personalized interactions for people, for example, on social media, this didn't change only how people interact with social media or internet platforms like Google and how they search for information. It changed media newsrooms and how uh, also traditional media communicates. It has changed our society. And this basically was done within five years. Five years later, by 2017, everyone was talking about the rise of fake news, the polarization, et cetera. This has occurred because of the information ecosystem changing, really, the, the digitized society. And public health and health system haven't really caught up with that. We really need to, because I just took out a couple of headlines that I picked up today uh, or that, that came up over the last three weeks in the media. The information ecosystem is poised to change very rapidly. Again, it continuously changing. So, for example, Amazon just uh, announced that we that they are in uh, an, uh, building infrastructure for high-speed internet enabled by um, uh, microsatellites, and that means that uh, the future of high-speed internet in many different places will be a reality much faster than what we assume which means that uh, Facebook is thinking about the metaverse, uh, which will profoundly, if implemented by one company, affect how our digital society works. And other technologies are coming into play that are interfacing with that type of information ecosystem. Now, I'm pointing here out innovations in the digital space, but not to discount how much the innovation in technologies have actually transformed how societies, even those that are still not completely connected to the internet, have really been changed by how people work, how they, uh, how they interact, and how they share information. Now, going back to interventions, uh, Liz and I prepared six buckets of truths uh, for building interventions for the infodemic, uh, specifically looking at people. And uh, Liz, let's do a tag, uh, tag team here uh, through this. Um, one thing that you've already heard about a lot is that we really need to be systematic and integrative when we think. Uh, so uh, just like Howard was saying, uh, our way of thinking cannot only be linear. We need to be listening and integrating analysis uh, and designing analysis plan based on what we know we're, we, uh, what we're uh, the perspectives of what we're trying to solve or, or perspective infodemic we're trying to address. We need to consider changes in programs, not just only in communication. We need to develop interventions. And there are models that Liz is gonna show later that can help us think through this and organize our thoughts around this. So the iterate, iterative thinking process <coughs> is really key. Uh, and this is a practice that doesn't come easily 
to public health uh, programs and action, but is really, really key uh, in order to, to design fast. Um, Liz, do you have any comments on this and maybe segue into the next one? Just to say, you, you really are trying to uh, work at multiple levels here. This is really hard. Um, and different disciplines, uh, when we're thinking about all the different disciplines touching the elephant, have all tried to diagnose and intervene in their own narrow in their own narrow windows of their disciplines and their and their niches and their perspectives. And what we need is a holistic approach. And that's where you all come in. And this is why we we constantly emphasize, not just in real life, but also in wisdom, the importance of leveraging many different skill sets, many different perspectives, um, and, and many different uh, disciplines. You need a lot of different disciplines to be able to design our way out of the infodemic, as it were. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to make your lives a little bit harder because you might be looking for that golden list of wonderful interventions that work really well to address the infodemic. Um, and you might be disappointed because it doesn't exist yet. Um, that's why you are all are here. Uh, if we already knew how to solve the infodemic, we wouldn't be here right now. So uh, we're going to add a little bit of com complexity to this picture. But just to say, we hope to arm you with the tools that you need to be able to design interventions and implement interventions and test them out um, in ways that are that are that are um, helpful uh, to getting us past the COVID-19 infodemic and beyond. Yeah, and also actually join the community of infodemic managers and collaborators and partners who are all trying together right now share experience and and move this forward so um uh, this is really critical um uh, as, as a global collaboration of people that work locally uh liz how about the focus on health behaviors yeah this is really critical um you need we we don't we need to focus on what is it we want people to be doing. What are they doing right now, and what what is it that we want them to be doing, um, and how do we get them from point A to point B? Um, messages are probably not going to be sufficient, um, and you really should not assume. Again, we repeat this again and again. Question your assumptions. Uh, don't assume that because someone's not doing something, it's because they're not motivated or don't understand. Uh, intention only sometimes translates to action. Um, I want to see people raise their hand for those who made a New Year's resolution to get fit and eat well and healthy. How many of you are still sticking to your New Year's resolution that you made in January? Raise your hand. <laughs> wow, Irene is one person so far. I want to see how many people's hands are raised. Oh, Catherine. Jorglan and Tanisha <laughs> and Catherine. Wow, okay, you guys are strong. People made out of strong, motivated stuff. Um, I failed three days in. Um, but that's okay. So the point is, is that there's often a huge gap between intention, what we want to do, or what we plan on doing, and what we actually do. Um, and so this is really, really important because it's not like you can push a button here and then suddenly the infodemic is affected over here or people's behaviors are affected over here. Um, there's a, a complexity of reasons and, and, and motivations about why people do the things that they do, as Howard explained. Um, and you know what it comes down to is the individual. Um, when we when we think about the the concept map, we also want to think about the fact that um, the infodemic we only detect once it reaches population level. Once we see enough people doing behavior X instead of Y, that we start to notice in the system something something's wrong here. Something needs to be fixed. Um, but at the but the infodemic acts on the individual level, and it's really really hard to predict. Like, how did the infodemic affect your uncle or your auntie or your other family member that's sharing misinformation compared to you? You guys are in the same family. So what is it about your experiences uh, and background in education um, that might be different from your family members um, that made maybe your family member more susceptible to misinformation versus you? So just recognizing that the, it comes down to the humans in the middle of this, 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 this whole diagram. Um, and that we need to also remember that um, Every individual uh, lives in a community, um, and that can be online communities, offline communities. It can be uh, your your cultural group, your ethnic group, your religious uh, your religious community, your your community that you work in um, or at school. There's a lot of different um, identities that we have that are multi uh, level and complex. Um, and I think this last point is particularly important: is that we often focus on behaviors of the general public and communities, but we forget to observe our own public health systems actions and behaviors that can be missing the point and reduce any chance to change final target behaviors. So I think for, for a lot of people, it was a rude awakening um, for those who work in the health systems. Um, the first group to be prioritized to get COVID-19 vaccines this last year were health workers. There might've been this assumption, well, you know, 
they work in public health. They work in, you know, in, in, in medical services and, you know, they know the importance and value of vaccinations. So why aren't they getting vaccinated? Everybody should be getting vaccinated in the health system. The fact that you had to do, do extra legwork to um, address their fears, their questions and their concerns so that they're confident in their own decision to get vaccinated was maybe something that we didn't realize would be as big of a hurdle until it was a hurdle. So the point that we're trying to make is that we can't assume that the health system, everybody's on board, everybody is contributing in their way to address the infodemic. Um, because sometimes um, those assumptions can also really shoot us in the foot. I'll give you another example. Um, you know, We are working with UNICEF in a country in Eastern Europe where guess what? Nurses are actually the ones that are more likely to give you misinformation about vaccines to, to, to mothers, to parents, to caregivers, uh, than addressing those questions and concerns that mothers and caregivers might have. And so how do you address that, you know, when it's actually the healthcare provider that is actively promoting misinformation? Um, so just recognizing that um, there's a lot of levels of the system that you need to be trying to influencing simultaneously, but don't assume that community just means some group of people out there in the public. Uh, the health system is also a community that you need to act on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, extrapolating further on this, uh, we also need to really rethink what a community, what are the communities we need to engage with, even within health system, you know, there's, uh, where are the actually touch points between people um, and, and the health system, and it can be things like pharmacists. And it can be people like medical librarians who are uh, helping patients with chronic diseases, uh, uh, trying to figure out, you know, how they're gonna uh, seek treatment. And these are all things that perhaps you don't think about outside of an emergency specifically, but all of these types of interfaces or connections between individuals within the health system and between the health system and, and individuals in, uh, in, in the population all of those actually affect how people end up thinking about evidence, about their decisions, about health behaviors, their protective behaviors, prevention behaviors, etc. <clears throat> so if you move on to the next three truths that we prepared, um, the next one I've already touched upon uh, with, with a big slide of headlines because I really feel very strongly about it, but it's extremely important that we always keep in mind that the information ecosystem is shifting really the pre-established models and paradigms of how we look for information, how we feel about it, how we use it, and how this affects the society uh, and behaviors at population level and people's individual behaviors. And this is being done very fast. So um, infodemic management as a practice and everything that we're, we're presenting to you, it's literally a, a way uh, of, of beefing up the public health practice to really think outside of the box in an organized and holistic way so that the public health practice evolves and our interventions and our the way that we manage the infodemic uh, is timely and effective and therefore effective and therefore that we for example during an emergency can actually support the acceptance and the uptake of public health and social uh, and, and adherence to the uh, public health and social measures or the uptake of, of recommended treatment or the uptake of, of, um, of, of vaccines. So um, it's uh, like one of my, uh, one of the things that I feel very strongly about, for example, uh, is that uh, currently uh, a lot of preparedness plans only suggest reviews of preparedness plans and the landscape analysis every two years. And in for them, in, especially when it comes to infodemic management and preparedness for this, the inf information ecosystem changes so, uh, so quickly, especially in a country, that we actually need to really be thinking about uh, are we, are we, uh, how quickly we, uh, we review and, uh, and are prepared to really think broadly about all of the different aspects of the infodemic so that we are prepared. Otherwise, we are literally setting ourselves up uh, to respond with outdated preparedness plans, for example. And uh, Liz already mentioned that, uh, you know, what works, um, we're still learning about. The science is still uh, working really hard. The, uh, WHO last year, we uh, set up uh, a dialogue between the uh, research community and health authorities to drive the public health research agenda on infodemic management. All of this is still nascent. We're still learning from experience, which is really important 
uh, to, <coughs> to keep in mind, because this means that you will need to, regardless of what your professional background is, you, need to, you will need to borrow from other fields uh, of practice, other scientific fields and test out new ideas and then report back to the community, share what you've learned so that we actually can uh, better understand the uh, and faster get to, to, to uh, a package of interventions that works. Um, and that then leads to the next point, which is that we really need to work and intervene faster. Uh, also outside of the emergencies, the bulk of infodemic management work is in preparedness and what we do in strengthening systems. Liz, do you want to reflect on that one? Yeah, I mean, I think what it comes down to is that, uh, you know, you reap what you sow. And I mean, we've all learned in the pandemic um, how, um, how under-resourced um, and um, underprepared many health systems were uh, for, the, for the pandemic, for the infodemic. And it really has put us on the back foot where all we're doing is constantly just firefighting. Um, and that, that makes it really difficult to be effective in infodemic management when you're trying to build partnerships and build trust in the middle of a pandemic with communities that might not have um, a lot of good reason to trust. Um, and so you have to balance this idea of like, what is it that we're able to reinforce and build now into the system for next, for next emergency, next pandemic? And what is it that we can do now? Um, I think it's it's also really important to recognize that, again, our brains work differently in emergencies. Um, so Richard talked about this during the CERC talk on, on Tuesday, um, and also recognizing that uh, we can only do so much really to, to move the needle. Most behavioral interventions uh, for any part of particular um, health, encouraging any kind of health behavior, you're probably talking an improvement in uptake of single digits. There's going to be very, very few interventions um, anywhere in in health, where you're going to have, you know, dozens of points of percentages of increase of um, uh, uptake of a specific uh, uh, health product or health behavior because you did one intervention. So usually it's cumulative. And I think that also kind of goes to the idea that you have to be comfortable with the idea that one intervention will not dramatically change behavior or fix the infodemic. How do you make an elephant do what you want it to do and do it willingly? And assume that we don't like abusing animals and that you can't just poke it with the stick to make it go in the direction you want it to go. So how do you how do we make the elephant move and to make it feel like it's its own idea to move? Um, and that's probably going to require a lot of different interventions simultaneously to, to make that happen. Um, and then I think this is also really true. Be comfortable with the idea you'll never have enough information of high quality to take perfect actions or to build splendid interventions, especially in an emergency. To quote a famous American GIF, nobody got time for that. Like we just do not have the luxury of time to do things as deliberately or as deeply or as thoughtfully as we would like. And so sometimes you have to really think what is sufficient and enough to be able to act on, to be able to create a better interventions, better guidance, better messages, uh, better communications and, and programmatic interventions. Uh, sometimes you just need something that is sufficient and maybe not overwhelmingly perfect and that's okay. We are working at pandemic speed and we will continue working at pandemic speed. Um, and Tina, I think you have some thoughts on the last point, especially around um, unattended consequences. Yes, so um, this is, uh, we really need to be thinking very carefully about the, uh, the ethics and the values through which we implement, uh, design and implement any intervention. Um, uh, in, in um, uh, the uh, discussion online, for example, about the, uh, uh, the moderation and uh, the content moderation of, of social media, uh, there's lots of discussion about and concern about uh, any type of policy interventions that may end up um, uh, curbing, being misused for curbing freedom of speech, for example. That is an example of uh, sometimes a, uh, of a well-intended policy or law that gets introduced that uh, if not uh, really considered uh, at, from the ground set of how actually an intervention would affect not only people's very narrow behavior, for example, of sharing in, information, but how that may actually impact the wider, uh, the, 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 the wider um, uh, society, uh, you end up, you can end up getting in trouble. Uh, so, uh, something that we end up doing uh, uh, to address a particular piece of misinformation or any pain point that Liz is going to uh, walk you through uh, may end up influencing a person, an individual, 
and have a very detrimental impact to their livelihood or uh, or um, or, or their, their way of connecting to a community that they feel strongly about. So for example, um, uh, why are the uh, coercive methods of, for example, the uh, vaccine certificate mandates uh, coming up with such a strong uh, opposition by some people um, is uh, because if they perceive it as, um, as um, uh, loss of control over their, their own actions and their own behavior, um, there will be a part of the population that actually will end up not just rejecting the particular mandate, but it will harden uh, their mistrust of, of other mandates and other interfaces with the health system. So um, we need to be really careful when we're selecting what interventions or what type of pain points that we're trying to introduce um, so that we don't um, um, so that we don't actually uh, have more uh, unintended consequences uh, in people's lives that end up actually completely countering the intent of what we tried to do. So I consider this really as, uh, as an ethical question of how we work. Um, uh, this is not you know, a theoretical or behavioral design uh, uh, context. We as practitioners, actually public health practitioners, we need to be extremely committed to, uh, at the outset, outset uh, uh, practice these ethical values of, we are trying to understand the human, their drivers, what are the barriers for them to enact health behaviors, and then really empathically and holistically address all of the environment around them uh, in a way that uh, actually enables health behaviors uh, by people instead of uh, them feeling that they are punished uh, or coerced in, into some action. This is just an example of this, but um, yes, I, I feel very strongly about this because sometimes it's extremely easy to lose sight we know following checklists, following frameworks, it's very easy to say, okay, uh, fall into a process to just push things out. But really listening also to what Howard was saying earlier about human centeredness, that empathy, that iteration, that self-reflection, it's not only about thinking about the person that we're trying to influence, it has to also be something that we ourselves practice uh, ourselves as well. Liz, would you like to <coughs> run us through the behavioral yes. interventions and frameworks? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna put on um, the Howard hat for a second. So uh, just to say that behavioral models can be useful for understanding the reasons why people do specific things and can suggest what interventions might address specific barriers. Um, and th this was uh, from the same presentation that, that Howard gave about the behavior change wheel, which harmonizes findings from many different behavior change frameworks, including those used for tobacco control and obesity. It can also be useful for epidemic um, management interventions. Uh, this is not to say that this is the perfect framework to use all to plan in for all the infodemic management things it is just one of many and um, i'll quote higher howard here all models are flawed but some models are useful this one is useful because it also provides interventions and policy categories so let's walk through this pretty quickly but there's more information in the bottom there if you'd like to get really really deep into how this particular model works next slide um, so let's take a talk about how we might think about behavior. So um, this is called COMB, and this kind of makes the core of um, this behavior change wheel. And it's, uh, you think about capability, opportunity, and motivation, and how that leads to behavior. So capability is what is that person's ability to literally do the thing that you want them to do? And then opportunity, or what are the opportunities or ways in which they can do those things? And motivation, what is the thing that is intrinsic or extrinsic? So inside of you or outside of you that is motivating you. So to give you like a really easy the example in the US, there's a lot of different ways we're trying to encourage people to get vaccinated. And so early on, there's a lot of focus on addressing access issues. If you're an older person and you, and you don't have a car and you're living in a rural community in, in, in the South, you know, we need to think about um, access issues. So how do we make sure that people are physically able to get to a vaccination site or that vaccination site uh, vaccination services are brought to their doorstep. And that also is linked to opportunity. So how do we uh, make sure that they have the opportunity to get vaccinated, make it as convenient as possible as a, uh, um, and, and make it as, as available as possible, not just um, being 
uh, physically close to a vaccination, but also that that there's um, multiple opportunities to get vaccinated, whether it's in the workplace or you know at um, you know at the health fair um, or at the farmers market, um, that there are multiple opportunities to offer that. And then motivation: how do we motivate people to get vaccinated? And there are different motivations for different people. So, for example, we saw an uptick in vaccinations after the Delta variant really started circulating in the United States um, in late July, um, and it was part partially because of this increased risk perception of geez, you know, this is really serious. I, I need to get vaccinated. So this motivated some people who might have been waiting and seeing or on the fence. They got motivated. For others, it's, hey, um, you know, get a gift card if you get uh, vaccinated or drive your car on the Talladega Night Speedway in Alabama um, if you get vaccinated. So different strokes for different folks, but all of these different um, aspects are linked to behavior. But how does this relate to epidemic management? So when we think about our five-step process, your social listening insights in step one can help you determine what your target population's capability, opportunity, or motivational factors might be at play, as well as larger health system structural and policy forces that impact their behavior. Um, this will also shift constantly, uh, requiring more updated programming and communications, that's in step two, and more rapidly deployed interventions and monitoring in step three. Infodemic managers can leverage social behavioral insights and other data sources for speedy action. The emphasis here is speedy. Um, and let's go to the next slide. So um, we were talking a little bit about this, about how you fast twitch muscles and you have slow twitch muscles. Usual social behavioral diagnostic tools and approaches in public health to determine why a population is not enacting a certain health behavior can take years to implement. In an emergency, we have to move faster. We, there's, it's a rapidly changing environment, more communities of concern, changing data and insights um, uh, that really need to be usable by health authorities and not just for academic audiences. Some diagnostic approaches need to be adapted for use in emergencies to deliver faster insights and programming. Again, what that means is that you're sacrificing depth for, for breadth, and that's just the reality of working at, at an emergency, that you just will not have enough information of sufficient depth or quality for you to feel super comfortable that, you know, an intervention that you designed is going to be the perfect intervention to address the issue. You have to do your best, and this is going to be a judgment call. And then... Um, it's really important. Embedding behavioral scientists and epidemic management teams is necessary to build a human-centered public health system, especially for those systems that are in that sturdy four by four category, or if you're luck lucky enough to have a luxury vehicle that you're driving in. Um, behavioral scientists are really, really important, and they're even rarer than unicorns. They're rare as hen's teeth. If you are lucky enough to have a behavioral scientist available to you, grab them with both hands. Um, they can be really critical for helping shape and understand um, some of those aspects of, 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 of human culture and, and communities and, 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 and the human issues that you won't be able to get out of CAP survey. And I think Howard really pointed this out, that often the data sources that we have on people's questions, thoughts, concerns, feelings, and, um, and emotions are not sufficient. And we need to sometimes do extra data collection, which goes to the next slide. So hat tip to WHO, you're a tip. Um, so TIP is tearing immunization programs, which are a series of tools um, that can be used to diagnose reasons for under vaccination in specific populations using the combi and the behavior change wheel. I highly recommend it. Um, there's a fabulous group of behavioral scientists that work in WHO Euro that have created this, um, this tool um, and the link is there. And so um, it's really useful guidance. And um, what I will point out though, is that this process can take up to two years. We don't have two years. So what we've done at, in the United States at USCDC, we've taken TIP and we've made a, um, a baby version of it called a rapid community assessment, where you can essentially do this, do some of this type of work in three weeks, um, just because we have to move faster. So the TIP is fantastic if you need depth, um, but we need sometimes a little bit more breadth. So um, get inspired by this tool. It's really useful. You can easily tailor it and customize it to what you need. Um, highly recommend it as a primer for how you can leverage social and behavioral science insights for action, not just for immunization programs. This also can be useful for other health program um, goals as well. And just to reinforce what Liz just said, um, with the innovation that we are all doing together uh, including with a, so, uh, with a social behavior scientist is actually how do we innovate methods and ways of working that we can be faster and still be effective, that we still have enough breath and satisfactory precision that we can then uh, move forward with uh, health programming, with policies, with interventions, uh, while we are, of course, in the back of, uh, on a separate track, working on 
uh, tools and methods that will be much deeper, that will be able to predict and quantify the, the outcomes of a particular, the impact of a particular intervention, et cetera. So we cannot wait. So we're working on double tracks and the importance of working with behavioral scientists and everyone actually in your team is to innovate and, and find ways of working faster effectively and intervening faster effectively. So let's move on to the pain points, Liz. Yes, absolutely. Um, and just one more note, if you're looking for a behavioral scientist and you're looking under rocks and, uh, and, other, and other things, looking behind corners trying to find them, you will most likely find them in HIV programs, um, in, um, in chronic disease and health programs. You'll health find promotion. them- Health yeah. promotion. You'll find them in immunization programs occasionally. So you could find them. They just might not necessarily be you know, in the emergency response cluster. So um, and, look for them where you can. <laughs> yeah, and when I've spoken to them, they didn't really see how they connect to the infodemic until we started talking. And this is, this is actually the challenge. The expertise that we have available in the health authorities sometimes is hidden. And we, we actually need to actively connect the dots and explain because actually the things that we are explaining is actually how other programs have been thinking. EMR, for example, has a huge behavior change component to uh, um, uh, that, that actually is also explaining very similar uh, approaches. But what we need now is not only to connect with other programs across the health authority that are doing this work and, and, um, and the expertise. What we're, what we're saying is we need to now also uh, um, add this much more systematically to the public health practice and the public health system. So this is being done in pockets in many different contexts. Expertise is in health authority in many different pockets. What we need to do is go the next step further and reinforce the health public health system as a whole. And this is why, for example, thinking about, okay, pain points, other colleagues across the health, uh, health authority may actually be able to identify themselves in some of these pain points because they also think about them, but maybe not, not holistically. Liz, would you walk us through? Absolutely. So um, when we think about pain points, here's some domains you can explore in step one in that social listening component and in the integrated analysis to understand why there might be a gap between health guidance and what a population might be doing. So consider what people are feeling. What are they wor confused about, worried, angry, happy about, have other strong feelings about? Um, what do people know? What are their knowledge, attitudes, practices, and beliefs? Um, where are the information voids? This is important, both the blind spots for you as a health authority or those that are trying to understand the infodemic, but also what are people looking for that they can't find? Um, think about how official guidance is being shared, how it's being discussed, how it's interpreted or remixed. Um, and then think about how people are behaving or signaling related to um, a recommended health behavior and focus on the why. So you can think about um, you know, digital footprints and behaviors such as um, um, mobility uh, data, for example, looking at video image and text reactions, hashtag use, are there alternate behaviors? And we'll talk about this later. Um, think about what efforts are being tried by health authorities to support, uh, support specific behaviors. So what are health authorities doing beyond messaging? <laughs> How are they uh, making it easier for people to do the thing that they want them people to do? What seems to be working? What seems to not be working? Uh, look at um, health service um, uptake and use data patterns and outliers in health status reporting to understand where's the gap uh, between maybe what you're hearing online versus uh, what is being reported into the health system. And is there a difference between popular perception versus reality? This is really important to understand because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the reality is if the perception is shaping people's behaviors. I'll give you an example. Um, I work very closely with our vaccine safety colleagues um, and they see their our role as being really important about having a really strong uh, vaccine safety surveillance system in the United States. And of course, supporting um, our colleagues in other parts of the world who also do vaccine safety work to ensure that the, all the vaccines that are available um, are, are, are safe and that we continue adding to the to that body of literature that, that says they are safe and to detect signals if we think that there's some sort of vaccine safety concern and be able to respond quickly. The problem is, is that you can say all day long to a group of people that vaccines are safe and they're effective, um, but that doesn't matter if the perception, the popular perception of the safety of a vaccine is dramatically different than what the reality is based on what our, our reporting data says. So I sometimes have to like reiterate the fact is like you, you can say that the vaccines are safe all day long and point to a huge pile of, of literature that says that that, but 
it doesn't matter if the general public doesn't perceive the vaccines to be safe. So sometimes there's a difference between perception and reality. And to be honest, as an infodemic manager, you need to understand where there, there are those gaps so you can address them. Um, and then think about what are the internal pain points within the health system or emergency response that might make it difficult to update communications and programming. Um, there are many pain points. I can tell you that from firsthand experience. A lot of that has to do with clearance. A lot of that has to do with whose role or responsibility is it for one health authority or, or, um, or one part of, US of, of government to do it compared to another. For example, what can CDC say versus the FDA versus HHS versus WHO versus what's delegated down to states and jurisdictions in their health departments. So it's really important to understand where things are going wrong and where things seem to be a lot harder than they should be and try to um, add, um, add um, some lubricant, some silicon lubricant to those places so you make it easier for people to get, overcome these barriers and pain points as much as possible. Yeah, so um, we are taking, we're trying to speak slower than usual. This is why our, our lecture is a little bit longer. So we have this example to show you. Uh, after this, we'll go to break and then we'll actually have others talk about what they've been doing during the pandemic to give you, get you a little bit inspired. So the example of all of this thinking that Liz and I prepared for you is um, the uh, misinformation that's been circulating about unproven treatments uh, which has contributed to ivermectin overdoses and medication shortages uh, in many countries. Um, and this has been in the headlines across many, many countries in all continents. Um, so this is a recent example. So for example, what are, uh, what are, for example, the pain points that you can pick up as an infodemic manager in the green box in the information ecosystem? Um, for example, uh, the social media is promoting an ivermectin uh, in certain groups online, whether they're particular social media groups or or certain groups that are linked towards uh, uh, that are linked also through, I don't know, algorithmic content promotion. So those groups are often linked with conspiracy thinking and uh, and and actually are not specifically looking at medical misinformation they're actually uh, it, it's it's reinforcing of the world view um, i've already mentioned algorithms so social media algorithms uh, may be promoting this highly engaging content uh, content including content about ivermectin and the controversy uh, search engines for example may offer ads for ivermectin prescriptions uh, when they look, when uh, someone is looking for ivermectin information, this is all ad-driven design of the information ecosystem. Um, or, for example, message framing around in ivermectin uh, that we may be using includes um, uh, or or includes resistance to medical coercion or or protecting medical freedom. So it plays on 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 uh, on on these views uh, of people when they receive the, the information. Um, so this is the information ecosystem part. And then Liz, how about the individuals? Yep, so people are searching for alternative treatments and find alternative health information. So when people are looking for information about ivermectin because they heard about it from a family member or friend, um, they go down rabbit holes online. Um, of course, if you have a history of mistrust be uh, between your community um, and the health authority, uh, that's this is just going to lean into into this narrative even more. Um, and so, what's interesting is that in the United States, we've seen um, more news coverage and narratives about um, people who've had family members who've come down with COVID nineteen who end up in the hospital, and then the family is advocating for use um, of uh, ivermectin being prescribed to the family member that has COVID nineteen. Um, and we'll talk about what, what kind of societal impact that has. But the point is, is that um, it's fueling this 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 online narrative that um, you know the the health system is not looking out for you. It's not the rights of the patient or what the family wishes or wants. And that um, also goes to uh, this next bullet point that some feel a degree of control over their health by choosing ivermectin themselves versus getting vaccinated, which is something that is done to you. Um, and so this is really important is this idea of um, agency and um, people feeling like I wanna do the thing that I think is best for myself. And so you have some degree of control about what you take by mouth because you buy it over the counter or you buy it online mm -hmm. versus showing up to um, a health facility facility or pharmacy and having someone uh, 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 vaccinate you with a needle. Um, and this is, I think this, there's really something here that really gets at um, why people might choose one thing over the other. Mm -hmm. 
And this is actually, in general, uh, a big challenge uh, if, if one looks into the health and wellness communities online. A lot of the reasoning uh, and, and, for example, brands, uh, the, the personal brands that the health and wellness influencers are promoting actually touch on, on this point that Liz just mentioned. But here's the one, this is the one part of, of this uh, mapping, the grouping that most of the time, uh, no other discipline is tackling. And this is what can you observe from within the health system? So we can observe deaths from ivermectin overdoses. We can uh, observe uh, increased poisonings being reported uh, through various uh, systems uh, of the health system. Uh, we can see calls, increased calls to poison control hotlines related to ivermectin overdoses and poisonings. Um, uh, increased cost of fertilizations, for example. Um, and um, also, which is really important and sometimes overlooked, uh, delayed and missed care for COVID-19 infections because people uh, were self-treating uh, at home which means higher morbidity and higher... Uh, uh, higher... Can someone please uh, mute uh, the colleague? Thank you. Um, and then there's uh, other things. For example, uh, you could observe uh, increased prescriptions for ivermectin by doctors for human patients, which has occurred. And, um, uh, or for example, veterinarians reporting that they uh, stock out, uh, which actually then affects livestock health. <laughs> and then Liz was mentioning, um, you know, on the societal level, you can you can then uh, put, pick up and, and see uh, uh, litigation, frivolous litigation uh, related to uh, people demanding uh, ivermectin uh, treatments versus um, uh, and, and basically hospitals uh, or practitioners uh, having to deal with frivolous lawsuits. This actually happens also everywhere, not just in this case um, uh, uh, as well. And of course, um, one big societal uh, issue that also is associated with it is that because there's an interest uh, uh, in ivermectin and, 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 and uh, it's being used, this actually indicates that uh, uh, a mistrust, an ongoing mistrust of public health guidance, which then is something that is that one needs to address not only through this particular piece of misinformation or acting on it, but actually really needs to be considered as a, as, as a whole. Um, so we are here uh, for a slido break before we end up going to a real break. Um, we wanted to ask you, what do you think would be some solutions um, for uh, to address this ivermectin case. Um, I will switch the projection to uh, Slido just a second. Uh, and let's see what you guys have answered here. So, I mean, maybe just to highlight that this is an issue that we've been tracking in the US. Um, I don't think we have any great solutions just yet, but th the point is, is that this only really became majorly apparent um, when um, a health, um, um, a Han was issued, basically a health alert was issued saying that a huge number of prescriptions um, for Evermectin were being reported as well as um, um, overdoses. And working backwards, of course, we had recognized that Ivermectin was peaking as an area of discussion online months before, but it's only in retrospect that we're able to figure out how these pieces are connected. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are and some solutions um, that you might, um, uh, how you might address this particular issue if you were in our shoes. So uh, one person says side effects. What else? People are probably frantically typing. Or thinking. I mean, <laughs> the, the difficulty here is, you know, the breadth of the considerations. And again, there's no perfect answer. So we're in the brainstorm stage of what Howard was describing. Just throw things out there. Yeah. I think one of the challenges with ivermectin that um, makes it unique compared to some of the other issues, and I think hydroxychloroquine, this also was, there was a bit of, bit of this then, but this idea that there was early research into the use of ivermectin um, and hydroxychloroquine in trials for, um, for treatment of COVID. And so to some degree, there is a, 
basically what we know is the science says that it doesn't work um, for, for, for treating COVID-19 or preventing it. But the point is, is that there are scientific papers out there where this was clearly trialed last year. And so that is used as a um, underpinning to make it sound more scientific, the reasons why ivermectin um, should be considered a, uh, a, a viable treatment or cure. Um, and so it becomes this reinforcing narrative, unfortunately. Um, so information ecosystem pre-bunk and debunk as well as inoculate, reinforce at contact points, health system target physicians, and public health volunteers. Absolutely. Not all studies are equal. Debunking myths using key influencers, trust issues with other drugs that the government might endorse. Same thing happened with hydroxychloroquine. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so personal stories from the people who overdosed. That's a, that's a powerful one. Awareness raising. National COVID task force should label ivermectin use as unsafe and as harmful, especially with overdose. That's interesting. Provide accurate information, provide physician opinion and testimony, work with pharmacists, human stories. Perhaps also work with those physicians that are prescribing <laughs> the drug to humans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think I saw a statistic that something like, like, uh, it was like a like a 24 fold increase compared to last year about the number of ivermectin prescriptions. Um, and and the jarring thing is what's probably happening is that people are going to their doctor saying, hey, I'd like to get a prescription for ivermectin. And the fact that you had tens of thousands of prescriptions being written, like how did that conversation go between the doctor and the patient? Like, why? Well, yes, that sounds great. Let me write you that prescription. At no point did the physicians like have a conversation with their patient being like, well, why do you feel this way? And um, you know, what is it that you're trying to protect yourself against? Maybe you should consider getting vaccinated or some other type of um, proven way of uh, protecting yourself. Um, rapid action might not always work. And oh, so these are some, uh, we asked for bad ideas. Yes. Um, harsh lawsuits, bad mouthing people, shaming people, um, limiting access or removing from the uh, market, shaming and blaming. Yep. <laughs> this is very interesting. Okay, you guys are on fire. Good job. Good job. So let's just show the types of interventions and then uh, go to break. Um, uh, and I just need to reshare the screen. And okay. Liz, you're on fire. All right. You can continue. Done, 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 done. All right. Now we're going to give you whip you through the categories of interventions. So these interventions can be easier and quicker to implement um, uh, to make small improvements, but the outcomes or impact may be harder to measure. It's likely you'll need to do multiple things simultaneously for higher degree of impact. So this is the universe of intervention categories. This is not to say you should be doing all these things or that some of these are necessarily the right answers. Depends on the question and depends on what your issue is that you're trying to address. So some of these are self-explanatory around education, persuasion, incentivization, coercion, training, uh, enablement, modeling, environmental restructuring and restrictions. I'll talk about very briefly about the ones that are not so obvious. Coercion, this can include things like um, workplace mandates and requirements, for example, um, or you know, throwing people in jail who share misinformation that actually has um, become laws on the books in several countries, um, which of course can be concerning um, for, for a variety of reasons uh, beyond you know, trying to address a public health issue. Um, enablement is this idea of like, how do you make it easier for someone to do the thing you want them to do? So back to my example of like, if you're an older person and you have access and mobility issues, having vaccinations being brought to your doorstep by mobile teams might be a better strategy than trying to get you to a vaccination site. Modeling is this idea of like modeling the behaviors that you want people to be doing. And so that's where like social influencers come in and really making um, the developing a social norm to support a specific behavior. Um, environmental restructuring. So uh, this can be literally like changing the architecture of the space that you're in, but it can also mean like thinking about the environment that you're structured in online. I'll give you an example. Um, and uh, I was in India in 2018 for their Muses Arello campaign where they vaccinated half a billion children. And between phase one and phase two, they ran into huge problems on WhatsApp of uh, lots of rumors circulating on WhatsApp. At the time on WhatsApp, you could hit forward on, an, on any kind of post that someone made and you could send it to everybody in your address book if you wanted to. So with one touch of one button, you could send it to thousands of people if you have thousands of people in your, um, in your WhatsApp chat. And so that was a problem. And this continued being a problem to the point that the Indian government told WhatsApp, unless you change this, we're gonna take action. Um, and what they ended up doing is that now you can forward it to five people. 
So you can forward it to a thousand people, but you have to do it five people at a time. So that one user, uh, that one user tweak in terms of the design experience added friction to your ability to share it widely very quickly with a lot of people. Um, and so that's one example of how you might restructure the environment to make it harder for people to share misinformation. And restrictions is another one, like limiting um, a particular intervention for a particular group of people. Um, and so that's another thing. I do wanna emphasize here that acceptability of interventions um, is really critical as well as understanding that what the possible unintended consequences might be of, some, of using some of these intervention categories. Uh, so just be very, very thoughtful uh, and considerate. Then there are also policy categories. These can be more expensive and then can take longer to implement, but they can have lasting systems System level effects and maybe easier to measure impact because you're collecting data on this at the systems level. That's regulation, service provision, legislation, marketing and communication, environmental and social planning, uh, guidelines, and fiscal measures. Um, so for example, one, one example of this in the United States is that um, up until recently, both healthcare providers were not actually being compensated for time that they spent counseling patients about their vaccine questions, concerns, fears, and misinformation. That, so basically a doctor was taking time out of their day doing that for free and hoping that that person gets vaccinated. So that's that that doesn't necessarily incentivize um, a healthcare provider having that conversation, addressing those concerns to get someone vaccinated because the only thing that they were getting paid to do was to actually get someone vaccinated. So thinking about how you might be able to use fiscal measures um, as a way to encourage the desired behaviors that you know would create that supportive environment for people to do the health behavior you want them to do, it can be really powerful. And so we kind of give you a whirlwind tour around um, both of these sets of different types of interventions that you can consider. Um, but what, when we come back after our three inspirational talks, um, we are going to um, take this, uh, uh, this approach, um, this combi model um, and, um, and the behavior wheel, and we're gonna apply it to a specific um, case example.